and um, is there someone who's anxious to go first? I'll just sort of I'll just sort of recap what I've posted in the tech sig over the last week. Um, I bought a uh, jumper notebook. It's a very small, very light, very low cost, two hundred and fifty dollar notebook. Comes with Windows. It's a thirteen inch screen, and I would call it a direct competition to Chromebooks because it shows you can run Windows 10 on a small notebook. Uh, the processor is only like 1.1 gigahertz. Um, it came with a 64 gigabyte flash drive that had Windows on it. Um, I'm trying to remember if it was two or four gigs of RAM. I think, I think it was four, it could have been two. No, it's, I think it was four. And uh, my intent was to make it a Linux book which I did do. So I documented all of that. I, I put the links on the text sig to two Google Photos albums. The first album was the unboxing and the setting up of the notebook, which is pretty straightforward as far as setting up Windows. And then I, I ran. Very graphic intensive, and I was able to play that game. Uh, although the uh, the bottom of the laptop got physically too hot to sit in my lap without raising it up or putting it on a on a tray, so I know it was really overtaxing the processor. What and then the I processor? then I put. Go ahead. Get a question, Stan. Yes. What is the processor? It, it was a, a Celeron, uh, let's see here, I think a two core. Uh, just bring that, that page up here. Uh, okay, so let me find my albums. And I was hoping it'd be one of my recent albums, so. All right, that's Linux on the jumper. Let me find uh, my jumper. It's a Chinese notebook. And uh, Let's see here, where is Becky? I did some speeds, here we go, okay. Am I set up to share my screen? No. Um, no, I'll do it. Okay. Making co-host. Okay. Okay. So it is a uh, Intel Celeron, uh, single threaded, but I think it's dual channel uh, or dual core. Uh, Celeron N3350 running at uh, 110. Oh, it did have six gigs of RAM. Okay. Yeah. So, so I guess Windows 10 can exist fairly well, reasonably anyway with six gigs of RAM, uh, internal Intel graphics. Um, it was a 64 gig um, SD, but only 57 gigs available after initialized in the system on it. Uh, let's see if we got anything on the second page here. Yeah, two cores, <laughs> two threads. What else do they have on there? There's the temperatures that it was running just more or less in an idling mode. 
I, I should have probably run the run, taken a look at Specky while the game was running, but I'm going to say it was 200 plus. It was hot. It was very, very hot. I didn't want to toast the, the processor. And there's the memory. What else have they got on there? The graphics. Graphic resolution is pretty good for a little notebook. I mean, it's, for 250 bucks, if you didn't want a Chromebook and you just wanted something to haul around that had a keyboard on it, uh, I'd say not, not bad. I'm pretty sure there's a picture itself of it up here. Yeah, there's a picture of the unit sitting on the table mm -hmm. with the background. Pretty, pretty good layout. The keys are, are very nice. Good response on the keys. Usually if it's a you know cheap keyboard, you don't get a nice feel. And the, the feel was pretty good. The uh, touchpad has all the uh, sensitivity adjustments that you can make. So, so what did you do with the Windows 10 program that was on it? Do you- I did a, I did a Mac, I installed Mac and Reflect. And then I did a complete image of all the partitions, including the recovery partition and the system. There were four partitions. There was um, a recovery partition. There was the Windows system partition. There was the Windows partition itself. And then a very, very small uh, unformatted section. So there were hey, four, part four partitions that made a backup. So did you just save that to? To an external hard drive. Drive. To uh, just as a as a backup in case you ever want to put that back on the computer. Right. Okay. Correct. Yeah. And then um, let me just go back to jumper here, and then Sean was very helpful in some of our Linux discussions of what to do to get Linux running. I thank you for that, Sean. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. I, I got a new microphone. I wasn't sure if it was working. The, the brand name is Jumper. Yeah. Hmm. It's funny. Um, I'm sure it's got its own Chinese name. <laughs> uh, on the bottom, you can see there's an, an opening um, with a uh, slot for an M2. Um, SSD and and there's a lot of I did I was totally ignorant of all the different kinds of N2 um, SSDs that are out there. So this is one that's sort of fat, you know, short and fat, if you will. Then there's some that are long and thin, and then even the circuitry on them is different. So this supported just this particular. SSD card and um, I it didn't even say in the documentation or on the listing in um, on Amazon and I had to send out a uh, help request to their to their support and they didn't answer but meanwhile in comments on the uh, Amazon listing I found out the specification of the drive so I was able to get that particular SSD and just make out the um, connections on here that went in there. So I could have gotten up to um, 512 and I, I got 240 because again, I was thinking in terms of Linux, that would be plenty. And when I, when I got it, if I go to the actual partitioning, uh, let's see here, there was a, God, there's a, there's a, Linux is not an easy operating system to install if you don't want the defaults. So let me actually go to what I wound up doing. So here is the, the, um, let me see here. This is the unknown. This is uh, 498. Why are they saying unknown? EFT and EFI and swap. 
Oh, megabytes. I'm thinking gigabytes. All right. I was all messed up. Okay. So um, these are the two flash drives. This is the 64 and this is the 256. And what you basically do, and you can see what how the partitions are, are set up. So you basically, I decided since I have two different drives, I could have put Linux completely on a 256 and have all kinds of extra space, but I wanted to minimize the writing to the larger SD and then specifically set the smaller one up for swap space and dedicated swap space, hoping that the shortage of memory would, would cause it to speed up. So Linux actually supports its own format of a swap partition. <clears throat> So the majority of that 64 megabytes is the uh, gigabytes, right? But six, 61, whatever it is. And the other thing I found out the hard way <clears throat> is that in order to use the, the uh, EFI type of, of, um, of BIOS and boot management, you actually have to set up an EFI partition in Linux. Now, again, if you take all the defaults, it takes care of it for you. But I, I wanted to go ahead and take, and I didn't know how big to make it. So I just, some recommendations said, you know, 256 megabytes. One guy said 128. I said, all right, I'll just take 512. So essentially that smaller 64 gigabyte partition, I made an EFI space, I made a swap space, and then I took the rest of it and made it the space that I was going to install Linux on. And Linux uses a format for its storage using the EXT file system. And they start with EXT1, EXT2, EXT3, EXT4. So EXT4 is the latest version of their file system. And the only other thing I had to learn the, the hard way was where to put the mounting point. And you have to put it in on the router. It doesn't take it. Yes. I thought I heard Sean say something. No, no, I'm just hearing things. Okay. So it once I did all of that, then then Linux just went ahead and installed, went through the the whole, it actually showed me what it was going to do, the partitions it was going to create, and went through an installation, usernames, and all the rest of that stuff. And and these kinds of things are pretty much the way same way Windows installs. I do like the fact that in Windows Welcome, it tells you about stuff. In the Linux Mint Welcome, not only does it tell you, but each one of these sections actually configures the, the operating system. So there's steps to follow in each one of these things, desktop colors and panel layouts and snapshots and um, the driver manager and it goes in and, and it actually will scan the computer, take a look at the hardware, see what software and what drivers are needed and go out and get it if you don't already have it. It'll also do updates. Um, and I'm using Waterfox as my browser and I specifically wanted that on this installation. And the Waterfox website itself did not have instructions on how to install it. It just had the download. And the download didn't tell you, have documentation on how to install it. So I had to hunt around and I finally found a tutorial that tells me how to do it. So I, I found out how to do it and that's installed. So anyway, it's now running Linux and I use it like I was using my Chromebook. And I do run my game on it, although it still runs hot. Um, so I, you know, if I really want to do something on the game, I come here to the, <clears throat> my desktop and play it. Hey, Mike. Yep. What's Waterfox uh, as far as a browser? What, why do you use that over anything else? Um, Waterfox is an open source Mozilla browser you're actually looking at. So let me just, um, see if I can get rid of this screen sharing window here. I'll bring it down. I don't, I guess you don't see that. Okay. So this is Waterfox. Um, and for all intents and purposes, it's Firefox. But the development team 
takes the Mozilla code and then puts their front end on it. So if I actually go to Waterfox itself, um, let's see if they talk about, okay, so they say no telemetry, they collect no data about where you go, what you do. Um, the only thing it sends back is the operating system and browser version to check for updates. That's it, what they say. Um, they, have, they use more plugins than Firefox does <clears throat> because Mozilla has the hooks. Not that I would use Silverlight, which is left over from Internet Explorer, but um, they even support Flash if, if somebody's got an older version of Flash. Um, I say modify, extend any way you want. Um, I'm not familiar with all of these things. Let's see, polish your user Chrome, modify the internals, it says. Again, this would be some for somebody that's really getting in there and, and knows how to do it. Right. And it, all the Firefox extensions are supported by Waterfox. So I can actually go, let's see if I go to my extension manager, uh, add-ons, extensions. So the only thing I have in here at the moment is LastPass. And that for me, we had talked, I think on last month's about alternative browsers. Right. Whatever br alternative browser I used, for me, I had to have support for LastPass. So I was very pleased that LastPass was in fact supported. Um, and just about all the Firefox extensions are supported. So it's, it's Firefox without the corporate overhead, uh, politically the company that distributes Firefox has said that they believe in um, some censorship for the benefit of the community. Well, who's doing that? If it's the same people that are the fact checkers for Facebook, then I don't particularly want that. So anyway, I know I'm not, I believe I'm not getting that with Waterfox instead of Firefox. So that's why I, I chose it. Okay, are they, uh, um, I'm really gonna say, um, are, you, are you using a DNS over HTTP or what, what are you doing for DNS? Uh, DNS, I use um, OpenDNS, um, which is a, um, server system that uh, filters for poison DNS entries. Um, and um, I've used OpenDNS for many, many years. Let me just, but you have probably reminded me that I have not, I don't know if it's a com or org, let me see. Yeah, it's open DNS. Okay. Consumer. They have they have themselves. Um, let's see. Well, I don't particularly. So they've got their own suite of free software now, too. Um, so they say with open DNS lookups, you get a hundred, you know, faster load ups. Um, there is parental control if you wish to set up an account so you can actually filter out the types of sites that you don't want people using your network go to, but they themselves don't filter you out other than they do have a list of phishing websites that try to steal your identity, they say. Okay, um, um, so that's what you're using for DNS, but you're, but, um, your internet service provider can still monitor that because they're because DNS is inherently is open port 53. So I'm wondering if this because I know that uh, Mozilla Firefox by default uses um, a, DNS over HTTPS. Can you go to the settings on this browser? 
yeah, just a second. Let me just, I wanted to see what the addresses are. I think it's, it's like 286. Come on, give me the IP addresses. I guess an open DNS IP addresses. There we go. It's 208.67.222 and 208.67.220, which you put in there. Now, you, you, want me, you wanted me to go into the settings? Yeah, the, the, the IP addresses aren't the same as the port number, though. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess that's under options. Let's see here. And then to search for the to search for DNS in the top there, find options. To the right, there you go. Type DNS. Click on settings where it says DNS below that. Scroll down. All right, at the moment, I'm using system proxy settings, which is the open DNS settings, but I could put in manual settings. Yeah, but go down. Is there, there's more to this. Go down. All right. See where it says enable DNS over HTTPS right there? Yes. Uh huh. If you check that, It'll use Cloudflare by default, but what's what's the drop down? So Next, yeah, DNS and custom. So you could use Cloudflare, and, and by doing that, anything in this browser that searches DNS, it would not be seen by your uh, by your ISP. Okay, I'm just doing it. That's done. Cool. All right, that'd be good to get some more information about that. Yeah. I'll send, uh, I'll send some info on that. I'll put it in the notes. Okay. So as, as a user, I, I find that it, it works pretty much like Firefox did. I haven't found that much difference. The, the icons and the settings at the top are all the same. You can import your bookmarks from, from other browsers, which is what I did. Um, you got a, you've got a, a bookmark manager, so you can go to all your bookmarks. And this is, you know, I've got, I've been slowly but surely updating my bookmarks. Um, what else? This is show bookmarks. Yeah, we just were there. Uh, history is the same. I'm not using any, I could use a Water Fox as a password manager if I wished. Huey had a great uh, video on um, passwords and different ways of, of storing passwords and generating passwords and password managers. And although I didn't check it out on Firefox, I noticed until I turned the feature off that Waterfox was actually suggesting passwords for me as I would create new accounts. <clears throat> uh, and they were the, you know, uh, letters, numbers, and symbols. Uh, and I could choose how many I wanted. And it was all within Waterfox. But I wanted the, I actually wanted a password manager that's across all my devices. So LastPass is, is across uh, this device, the Linux device, uh, my phone. And I'm probably going to share this account with my wife's computer. They do have, LastPass does have family memberships, but I'm just going to share it so she's got the same set of passwords that I do for her logged ins. So, Mike? Yep. Something that I, I mean, very recently discovered um, is that one password, and I'm wondering if LastPass does this as well, where it'll let you uh, use one time passwords, like within the app. You can set the apps up to give you the one time password. Do you know if hmm. that's, do you use that? I'm looking to see. Uh, advanced. Import, export. Identities. No. Extension preferences. Advanced. I know what you're saying. Just come up with a one-time password and then discard it. Well, the way, the way it works in 1Password is um, I set it up, you know, say, for instance, my bank. I set up my bank to, uh, it, to where it uses two-factor authentication. 
Yep. To set that up, you have typically what you have to do is you have to use like a Google Authenticator or yep. Authenticator by Microsoft, and it gives you the it gives you the QR code. You take your phone, you aim it at the screen, and it gives you it sets it up in the app. But LastPass, uh, it looks like it does support that, where you can have the app. You know, if you have your bank information in one of your last as one of your LastPass records, you can modify that record to also have the one time password in that same record. So right. you, you have it autofill your, your bank password and then the next screen it says, okay, what's the one time password? You right. Know, and have it do it there. Okay, I just misunderstood what you were saying. Yes, it does. And um, for Android and Apple, there is a LastPass authenticator app. So you can turn that on when you, when you set LastPass up for, um, authentication. So you have a choice. You can have the bank send you a text message or you can say I'm using LastPass Authenticator. <clears throat> then your cell phone, the the app will open up if you've set it to automatically open. And you can take the six digit number that's displayed or there is a, there are two buttons at the bottom of that, and one is reject and the other is accept. And if you press accept, it confirms from the LastPass authenticator on your phone back to LastPass, wherever you're using it, that you have done the two-factor authentication and you don't have to type in the code. It'll, it'll recognize it and automatically acknowledge it and you're in your bank or your credit card. Cool. Um, and there's been a couple of times when let's say I'm on the throne in the morning <laughs> and I have my notebook on my lap, too much information. And, um, <laughs> and, and I go to log in somewhere and my phone's in the other room and to, to log in, I need two factor authentication. Well, on my phone, I still use Google voice. I can't, totally divorce, <laughs> divorce myself from it. So if, if it's, if it comes in for the authenticator, then mm -hmm. I can actually on the site that's requesting two fact factor <laughs> authenticator say, don't use the authenticator, send me a text instead. And then it will send me, <clears throat> it'll send me, uh, I don't know if I've got one down here or not. Yeah, here we go. Ancestry.com is an example. <clears throat> so I had gotten authenticator code for Ancestry.com in my authenticator on LastPass, but I didn't have access to it. So I said, send me a text. So now I was able to go to the voice tab on the other computer, get the code and type it in. And that's part of the problem that I have is in my quest to de-Google find my life uh, I am so invested in Google Voice, I don't know how I'm ever going to get out of it. Um, and and it, I will have to admit to its convenience. And uh, I like the Google Voice numbers. And uh, I like the fact that it works with my phones. And I can bring up my text on my computing devices. Uh, so it's very hard to get rid of it. But uh, for the moment, I still have it. So. All right, so we've looked at we've looked at that. I guess there's nothing else I need to share, so I will stop sharing my screen. Is it a 13-inch laptop? Yes. What was your question, Sean? I wondered if it was a 13-inch laptop. I'm pretty sure. Maybe it's smaller. Let me hang on. Let me look at my uh, Amazon um, listing for it. So one more thing to look at, I guess. Oh, just yeah. grab a ruler. Well, it's in the other room, but I'll just go to my orders and and say jumper. See, I think it. I think it'll find it in my orders, and then it'll go to it. Yeah, thirteen point three. And that's the is that the laptop that's shaped like a MacBook Air with the with the comes to a point in the on the front edge of it. Um, the front edge is actually sculpted right here. No, I mean the okay. I see the side is 
it's shaped like a triangle on the side. Yes, yes. Uh huh. Comes down. Yeah. Oh, it's very nice. Two fifty nine. It supports up to two fifty six. Yes, Are that's. Sure? Oh well, they told me they told me I could put five twelve in, but okay. I only put two fifty six in. Gotcha. And it doesn't tell you what to get. So, um, I mean, even with that sixty four gigs in there, you know, trying to think in terms of how much space is it to put Windows ten on a typical computer, in my mind. I think along the lines of somewhere between 140 to 160 gigabytes, at least on a desktop. By the time I'm done and Windows is fully installed, so to get it in a, in less than 64 gigabytes and have space left over to actually run Windows surprises me. And and I did. I had I had space left over, and I could browse and do different things. And keep in mind that. Windows is installing itself. It's managing its own swap file um, in whatever space is left over, and it's still functioning. So uh, I don't know if this is a special version of, of Windows 10. I know there's been a lot of talk of Windows 10 coming up with sort of a mini system. How about that Windows 10 S that we were looking yeah. at? We Windows 10 S, computer. right. But this, is, this didn't say it was Windows 10 S. Not that it, it wasn't, but Windows 10 home operating system, yeah. So they say they've been around for 26 years. Well, I don't know. All I can think of is that their Chinese factory might have been making. Actually, it's they let's see, do they even say who they are? Visit the jumper store. What do they got? Yeah, you know, they jumper. Easy Book X3. It's a Gemini Lake processor. So it's a Celeron, but it's Gemini Lake, whatever version that is. Now let's say X3 Air and X3. So, oh, there's a new one then. What is that one? Oh, this one's 128 gigabytes. It's larger. <clears throat> 4100 versus 34. So it's got a later processor too. So they've realized, I guess they need a faster notebook. I haven't seen this one being sold yet. Uh, and then what? Easy book. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that just looks the same. Mm -hmm. ah, they're coming out with the small form, form factor box too. Lots of those showing up. And notice that says CPU Inter i3. I think that yeah. might be Chinglish for Intel. Yes. <laughs> yes. It said the same thing up on the uh, the other the uh, ones that were above. Oh, same thing here. Same. Yeah. Cel Celeron, whatever. Yeah. Well, there are videos associated with this, and of course, notice we have all Caucasians in these pictures. Yeah. But the videos that I saw that were on Amazon were a Russian accent. Yeah. Um, Eastern European accent uh, folks, which is interesting that they that they contracted with somebody else to to do their videos. Um, I, let's see if I have that. Um, let me go back. I think, yeah, here's their videos. charge your phone and it has a long life battery. You 
can search the internet um, non-stop for five hours. She was wrong. She pointed to one more USB was actually the HDMI, the, the mini HDMI port. <laughs> Talk about low budget with the uh, using her cell. He's, somebody's using a cell phone vertically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Wow. So uh, I don't know how to get out of this. Uh, there we go. There we go. So I didn't I didn't put much. Uh, credence in in their uh, their videos in my purchase decision I was doing it more on the specs and realizing too I could have returned it if I didn't like it all right well thank you Mike that was very interesting and I'd like to take it for a moment when we were, you were talking about browsers I'm not sure whether it was the last one of these or at the main meeting I brought up one that I just recently heard about called Cobalt. And let me see if I get into share. Cobalt, cobalt like the, the, the oh, mineral or yeah. the color? Yep, Cobalt, yeah. okay. And if I, I want to share my screen. Here, share screen. And share. And now, if I go there, if I get that out of there, this is this is the page with an overview, and it it's way over my head. I don't follow exactly what they're talking about. It's okay, what they're saying here, <clears throat> just as Mozilla has uh, many open source browsers associated with it and Waterfox was one. Chromium is from the Chromium project is open source. So Google has taken open source Chromium and then built their browser Chrome from it. And they contribute back to the open source project as they make changes. So again, any developer can, just as they can take Mozilla and make their browser, any developer can take Chromium and make their browser and it's totally independent of Google. It's just using the Chromium code. Okay. Well, here it talks about using very little memory, works on slower CPUs. I did see something of, it is open source and they're, they're very high on privacy but there's also, they talk about this cobalt porting in interface. We have created a hard straight C porting layer. Uh, so all third party li libraries, instead of using the standard libraries, which they say aren't consistent across across all modern systems like Android, Windows, Mac, and iOS. So apparently they're using their, a different library that interfaces with Chromium. Interesting. Well, I will, I will see if I can put that on, um, they probably have the ability to put it on Linux. And if so, I may try putting that on the little notebook and seeing if it if it plays with it. You want me to send you this link? Well, it'll be in the show notes if if uh, Sean puts them in there. CobaltGoogleSource.com. Okay. Well, I'll give you the this back. See, chat. What uh, browser are we looking at this in? Are we are we in are we in Cobalt or are we in? Uh, no, I've not been oh. able to download it. To oh, I've I've not actually got it up and running, and, and I think what I've what we're looking at here is Chrome. Okay. <clears throat> On this machine, I've been using Chrome and what's that? 
Uh, another one called Torch. Uh, this doesn't look like a web browser. This looks more like a kind of code that you'd use in a web browser. Oh, all right. Is that what is that correct, Stan, or do you know? I'm sorry, the question was what, Sean? It doesn't seem like it doesn't seem to be an actual web browser. It seems more like code that you could. This is a developer type website where it's for uh, storing code and, and using code on web web interface web browsers, not necessarily a web browser itself. Cobalt itself, you mean? Right. I see. I don't think it's a. I just searched for Cobalt web browser just in Google, and it doesn't come up. Yeah, chemical element. <laughs> Let me just try web browsing here. They may be setting it up as a platform for other developers. Uh, Cobalt browser, fast, secure. Go to uh, cobaltbrowser.com, Sean. Okay, thank you. It looks like it's portable because it says get it on Google Play. So I'm looking to see if they have a, a desktop version. It looks like somebody basically took it and uh, created a portable browser from the COBOL platform, but I don't see it for a desktop. Yeah. All right, I put it. In, I put it in the notes. Okay. Okay. And while I got the floor, let me ask if any of you have heard of the tablet mode in Windows Ten for people. So if I have a notebook and 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 it it can flip over into a tablet, are you saying Windows 10 will recognize that and, and go to a tablet mode? Yes. Ah, it okay. came up not in the very first version. I want to see if I can't find it. I I came across it with a client who whose machine did just some very strange things, and. I did see it on this Asus. This is the club, you know, the, the one that Huey used to use that I was bringing to the texting. And now I'm not seeing it. Mike, you got a comment? Yeah, I've got uh, one unit that's got uh, Windows 10 with a removable keyboard. Therefore, once you remove it, it does become a tablet. <clears throat> so you have tablet mode, but there are disadvantages to that. Sometimes you don't want to set up tablet mode, but still it's there. And the, yeah. there are removal, it's an ASUS. And all you have to do is just remove the keyboard and then you've got a tablet. Well, that that's exactly what this mode is for. Right. And, and the person who I was trying to help got into it on their desktop. I was not aware of it and I it was not possible for me to get out. I, I spent about an hour, hour and a half doing all sorts of things, couldn't, finally took her, just, just her desktop. You know, I didn't take the monitor and keyboard, but I took it home and, and I was tired, it was late at night. And I the next morning, I, I, I didn't do anything with it that night and the next morning, I said to myself, I don't have any idea what I'm going to do next. I'm going to take it to refresh. And I took it to refresh and dug, plugged it in, turned it on, and immediately said, oh, you're in tablet mode. And he got out of tablet mode. <laughs> it was right back to her desktop. I mean, I had all sorts of shortcuts set up for her that she just clicked on a Chromium um, stand. <laughs> icon and it went right into her email, for example, and another one went to some of her favorite sites and I couldn't get back to that. It was crazy. 
Stan? Yes. Uh, what it is is in notifications to the lower right. When you get all notifications, you can get in and out of tablet mode from there. And so that's in your notifications area. So I, I can see that a notification will probably apply to a desktop as well as a laptop. So your notifications would allow you the option of getting in and out of tablet mode. I'm doing a search. No, that wasn't right. Well, I found it in setup and asked me before switching. Hmm. Well, I was quite sure that even if I could find it, I was nervous about trying to do it with my shared screen because I think it's probably have to bollocks things up and I thought it would probably you know shut the whole thing down with me being the major host so all right that that's enough of that one I, I may, maybe I'll I'll do something with it for next time but uh, and I guess that's uh the, the two things that I wanted to bring up the cobalt and then this tablet mode and who else is uh, ready to share Sean you got anything for us yeah, I've got quite a few things. Uh, Let me to set you up for sharing the screen. <clears throat> uh, I don't know if I really need to share. Oh, okay. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I guess I can share. I guess I can share the screen. Let's see. All right, I'm stopping share. All right. And then we'll go to participants and Sean and more. Make co host. Uh, you should be able to do that now. Okay. Yep. I see you. Okay. Let me do a couple of, I'm just opening a few tabs here of things that I recently purchased. I've, re I've gotten quite a few things here, apparently. Uh, That ought to do it. Okay. And I can share my screen. I guess I, let's see here. Let's get rid of this window here. Um, so share screen. Okay. Okay. See my screen? Mm -hmm. Yep. <clears throat> So I, uh, well, let me start off by telling you that I'm no longer going to work for the man. I've decided I'm going to go out on my own and just be a consultant. Right. So um, I am not trying to go back to, I was, for a while I was, I've been unemployed since September. Uh, I've been looking for work. I've been studying Amazon Web Services. Um, I've been going back and forth. I was, re somebody reached out to me from AAA wanted me to come and do a desktop support there. I did an interview, which I thought went well. That was last week. And um, I just didn't, I didn't feel it. You know, I didn't feel like, um, like I, I didn't get energized or excited about it. So I've been, I've been doing some consulting and that has been energizing to me. So I've decided to just go ahead and uh, try to get more clients and, and just be on my own. Um, my wife works and has insurance and all that. So that's not an issue. Uh, which can be, that can be stifling for somebody that's trying to run their own business. So with that being said, I have a, uh, I'm upstairs in my office and I have a Mac Pro that doesn't have a webcam. So I recently, as actually earlier today, I went and bought a webcam. It's a, uh, it's a Logitech Logi. That's what I'm using now. And I bought 
uh, my, you can't see my monitors, but I've got two monitors that are underneath a shelf and there's no space to put the, the, the camera on top of the monitors because the shelf's right there. So I bought this device that uh, you clamp onto the, I clamped it onto the side of the shelf and you put the webcam on it. And actually the webcam came with a USB cord that I, with Velcro strips. So I've got the cord going along the edge there. Actually, the, the, this, this mount came with those USB, or came with the, uh, the Velcro strips. So um, I'm getting used to it. I just said, I mean, 15 minutes before the meeting, I set it up. So uh, I'm sure I'll probably tweak this somewhat. Um, I don't have the, I don't have, I didn't, I bought it at uh, Best Buy, but I, I'll put it, I'll put a link to the, the actual camera I got. Uh, I like the image. I think it's a decent image. It's a 1080p camera. Um, also, I was talking with somebody today on, uh, on through a, I forget what I was using, the microphone I was using to talk to this uh, a client today. And uh, it was a bad, the microphone, it, he was getting feed, weird feedback and so forth on his end. So I thought, well, I might as well get a nice microphone. So I got this, I did a search, I think on a uh, wire cutter to find the best microphone. And uh, this came up. And this microphone is, uh, it's actually, it's actually pretty nice. It, it was $130, um, but it's got quite a few options. It's USB, it just plugs right into your USB port. And uh, the, the computer just instantly found it and it let me select it as something. It has some, some features where I can adjust the uh, inbound uh, microphone level, as well as telling it what kind of microphone it is. It's a, either a wide microphone or uh, omnidirectional and so forth. So, and it's got some good weight to it. I would say this thing is probably, you know, five or six pounds. It's all metal. So uh, happy with that. Um, let me see if I can get around this. There we go. There we go. Um, and, and I got one of these for my, can you still see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, my wife, so she works up and we have an uh, apartment over our garage and she works up there for uh, for her job and she sent me a text message the other day hey they didn't get a quiet keyboard so I uh, found this I searched for quiet keyboard on Amazon and this came up and actually it turned out that it doesn't say it in the in necessarily in the description here but we bought this keyboard it's wireless it use a, uses a, a dongle that plugs into a USB port and uh, it is nice and quiet so uh, I think that's working well for her. She hasn't complained about it. So I'm, I, I, that's a win for me. Um, just install that the other day. Also, um, I bought one of these stands for my laptop because I was, I was actually thinking that it, instead of using the Mac Pro at this desk, I'd use my MacBook Pro uh, and do video meetings with that. Uh, I've kind of gone sideways, sideways with that. Uh, but it's still nice to have a laptop uh, stand. Uh, it never hurts to have an extra one of these. So. Um, I like it. It's it's um, it's stiff. Trying to get it to open and close, I think I need to adjust the the torque on these screws. It, it I can move it. It's certainly the, the laptop. If once I put the laptop on, it's certainly not going to fall fall down. So it's it's tight enough for that. Um, what else? This is a camera I originally got. Uh, I bought it just a few days back and. Uh, I wasn't really crazy about the camera itself. Uh, and one thing I wanted to do is I was, I was thinking about mounting, mounting this camera upside down on the shelf uh, above my monitors. And I bought some software on the app store that I was hoping would allow me to just flip this, flip the image over. And I contacted the developer and he said, no, that's not something that my software does, but I can add that. And he said, well, do you mind if I ask why? And when I when I explained it, he uh, he added the code to do that. Um, but I've since I've not real crazy about this this camera. After all, so I wound up sending it back. That's when I got the Logitech. Um, this is not super tech related, but I have a thing with lighting. <laughs> it's, I have I like night lights. Like if I get up to go to the bathroom or go to the kitchen, um, I like to have a light that I that just comes on and goes off only during the night. And I like it to be battery powered, so I can put it anywhere. I found these Avon lights; they're uh, rechargeable, and they come with a little puck 
that you actually just stick on the wall and it's magnetic. So this, um, this light sticks on the wall and then that puck, I don't know if there's, actually if it shows, it doesn't actually show the puck, but to recharge it, it's supposed to last 180 days if you have it on the low, low setting. And to recharge it, you just simply pull it, pull it off the wall, which it comes off nice and easy. And uh, you just plug it in with the cord that they send you into a USB uh, chart. Everybody's got USB bricks all over the house. And uh, so I can charge it up that way. It came, this came with two, but I'm actually thinking about buying more. I like it that, I like them that much. And it's something that's so simple. And for the two of them, it was like 16 bucks. And you can get uh, more than just two in a package. I think you can get up to six or eight. Um, yeah, there's one, there's a six, six top there or six for 23 bucks. So, I mean, um, well, that's a plug-in model. This one's the, I'd, I'd want the one that is battery rechargeable. So anyway, very happy with that, that where that worked out great. Um, also, I posted, I think a message about uh, some of the ways or wise products that I recently got. Um, I'm super happy with this, uh, this wise uh, scale. It's the first smart, I've had three or four smart scales now. This is the first one that you just step on it and the numbers come up just like as if, just as if you had a, it was a not smart scale. And uh, I like that. And it connects to your phone with a Bluetooth. It's not Wi-Fi. So just have your phone nearby. It connects with and updates your app to tell you what the weight is. It also, uh, it just does weight and body mass. That's it. That's all I care about. Uh, it works great. I paid $19.99 for it. And it's a good quality. It's glass. It's metal. I don't know how they made any money on it. It is, uh, it is a nice scale. So um, I got $19.99 from the WISE site directly. I didn't buy it from Amazon. Looks like they're charging more for it here on Amazon. And last but not least, I bought these a few, probably a month ago, three weeks ago. Uh, these are computer monitor, computer speakers that plug into a, your computer with an uh, a audio jack. And um, they sound great. I'm, I'm really happy with, with them. Uh, they sit nice, perfectly under my monitors, and uh, they sound decent. And for for twenty dollars, you really can't go wrong. And I, I read in the uh, you know there was it's twenty it's four and a half stars with twenty thousand almost twenty one thousand ratings. So I thought I'd give it a shot. Oh, it was no, it was seventeen dollars. <laughs> so if you're in need of computer speakers, which I was, I had some nice. Uh, these replaced a set of the Bose, um, I forget what they're called, Bo they're, they were Bose computer speakers that sounded absolutely fantastic when I bought them, but they're, they were 15 years old and they were starting to crackle. So, and I didn't really want to spend a lot of money. Um, so I bought these for 17 bucks. They don't sound like the Bose when the Bose were new, but they shouldn't. <laughs> for 16 or 17 bucks, they should, I, I'm very happy with the way they sound. So I'll, I'll include a link to these as well. I'm, I'm, I'm tickled pink with those. So uh, I think that is it. I don't know, anybody have any questions? That's quite a wide variety. <laughs> You've been busy. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I'm trying to get, get things set up. Yeah, Mike. Uh, yeah, uh, will you include in your notes the actual notice, if I want to Google any one of these items, uh, you know, in other words, <clears throat> the appropriate name, then I can Google the item. But also, too, if you can reference the source, uh, what were you saying? There's something wise? I'm not familiar with that. So, wise, W Y Z E, is a company. Uh, they notably, the first, their first uh, product that they came out with about two or three years ago is the Wise Cam. And I don't have one here with me, but I have several of them. And it's just a little, in fact, I'll bring it up here on the screen. Uh, let's see. Uh, so that that is like an Amazon source. I can't read in the address bar where you are. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll W-Y-Z-E. W-Y-Z-E. I see it there. 
Mm -hmm. I'll put those things in the, uh, I'll put those, in, that information in the notes. Um, anyway, you asked about this. This is the, this is what, this is the second generation of the camera, but this looks very similar to the original. And they became popular with this, but they've started adding more and more uh, products to their lineup. Uh, notably, um, uh, let's see, I just showed you the, uh, the, the wise scale. And I think it's, yeah, $19.99 plus shipping, which I think I got free shipping for some reason. I don't think I paid shipping. Even if I did, it was maybe five bucks. And so still 25 bucks for a scale, fantastic. I don't know, I don't know, they can't be making money on that. Um, and then I also ordered, I didn't mention this, but I also ordered one of these wise thermostats for $50. And this is a smart thermostat, it's Wi-Fi uh, and so forth. Uh, it says pre-order on here. But I, I received it already. I received it last week and I got it all hooked up and it's not working. It's the, the app walks you through how to, how to configure it and then it'll tell you if the wires are incorrect, if they're, if they're plugged in in the incorrect places. Cool. And uh, they're not. I mean, I, I followed, I took, I took a picture of the prior smart uh, thermostat of what, where all the wires were plugged in. I labeled the wires. I took it apart. I, I put the uh, wise thermostat on the wall and stepped through the process. And it still says, uh, hey, you're, you are you got to switch these wires. They're not plugged in correctly. And I did try switching them around, even though they were, I thought they were correct. And I didn't break it or anything, but it just was, it wouldn't get past that step. So I plugged the old thermostat back in. It's still working. But uh, I, I reached out to wise and they um, replied once and wanted a, another picture and then that was it. I never heard back from him again and that was last week. So I'm not happy about the, they, they're not working on the weekend. I mean, this is a major company. They should be, their, their tech support, they're, but they're probably busy, but their tech support should be responding. I also responded again today and they haven't replied again. So I may, I may open a new request uh, uh, just because I, I want to get this, to, I want to either get it installed, which is what I'd prefer or I will mail it, I'll re return it and get my money back. So, um, you know, the last thing I wanted to talk about, I, I, uh, I made a note while Mike was talking about that last pass, which is great. I'm big on password keeper. I think password keepers are great. Um, there's a, uh, and I just renewed my subscription to Bitwarden. Has anybody heard of Bitwarden? No. What was the name? Uh, Bitwarden. It's an open source password manager. Um, and it is, uh, they have uh, versions of Bitwarden for uh, all operating systems. The great thing about it is, first of all, it's open source. So you got the community looking for flaws. And additionally, the price isn't bad. I pay, I think $10 a year uh, for, uh, I forget now. I thought it was ten dollars. I just renewed for ten dollars. I think today, and uh, it includes it's like a family membership. Um, but Bitwarden, I would recommend looking at if you're if you're not if you don't have a password keeper yet, you should get one because you should not be using the same password for every website. Uh, I, where I'm probably preaching to the choir here with the folks that are on this call, but uh, urge your friends to also consider a password keeper so you can change have different passwords for everything. Um, and Bitwarden is, uh, is I would consider to be a, a valid, uh, inexpensive and open source is good. So, um, you know, closed source is what scares me because if you know, there's places like, you know, solar winds, it's closed source um, <laughs> and they were hacked. So uh, <laughs> not sure if that's why, but you know, they're, they're not open source. <laughs> they're, they're hiding something. You can't look, you know, people that are smart enough can't look at the code and say, uh, oh, there's a problem here, uh, fix it or I'm not using it. And they're, they're, it's closed source, so they can't look at the code and they don't know if it's bad. So uh, anyway, Bitwarden, look into it, read about it. I found out about it from a tech uh, podcast that I listened to by a guy named Tom Lawrence, who uh, talked about it a couple years ago or maybe a year and a half ago. Um, somebody that uses it is uh, Sheila Bagel. I don't see, I saw Gary on here earlier. Not sure if he's still on here, but Sheila was looking for something, and she wound up installing that and uh, sent me a thank you. She really, uh, she really likes it, so um, it's worth checking out. 
Anyway, any questions? All right, that's it for me, Stan. You're muted. Yeah, Gary did leave at some point. I'm not sure why, but, uh, uh, and I have heard of that. And I, I started to look at it once and I got pulled away, I guess. So I'll have to look at it again. That was a way for me to unshare my screen. Uh, how do I do that? At the top of the screen, there's usually a drop down box. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it's on the other one. Great. Stop share. Thank yep. you. All right, thank you. All right, Forrest, what have you been up to? Uh, little as I can get by with. Um, I, somebody emailed me the other day and asked me, uh, messaged me about a, what antivirus I was using. And I've been using a bath for years. And uh, I just got a new um, consumer guide in, and it has antivirus, soft, antivirus software. It's, it's said they rated 34 products, tested 34 products. Two of them I've never heard of. The, the first one, the overall score of 82, which didn't seem very good to me, but it's ESET, E S E T, Internet Security 2020, it's $70. And I think they've got three different price ranges. And the second one that was rated overall score of 81 was Avira, A-V-I-R-A, free security suite. And that's free. Has anybody heard of either one of those before? I have heard of ESET uh, various times. They've given us <coughs> sample slash free annual um, disk going all the way back to the floppy disk days okay. and um, they used to be a sponsor on uh, Leo Laporte's uh, tech podcast although they're not currently they don't expand on them I just said I went to the internet I didn't have much time and just looked at, looked at one, one of them and that was all so uh, I just didn't know is malware, for, is malware bites on the list anywhere no they just they, um, they listed those two and then they said a uh, the best free antivirus for, for Max is AVG antivirus for Max, and that's, they rated that at an overall score of 67 at no cost. And that's the only three they have. Since so they tested 34, and I hadn't gotten all the way through it, but that's all that's on that page. What's the one for the Mac for us? Is it Clam AV? Um, AVG antivirus for Mac. That's all it says, and it's free. What's the name of the publication again? Oh, um, Consumer Report for February. Cool, oh, thank you. What month, what month, Forrest? February. Okay. They rate a lot, you know, they got a lot of other stuff in there rated and all this, but usually they, they take it way on down and many things that they tell you about, but this just stop with that three. So. And that's all it said about them. I'm just curious because this other this guy in the uh, genealogy club was asking me, but I've oh, I've used the uh, Avast Premium and never had any problems with it. So, that's all I've got. Okay, Paul, what's up? You, you did a little bit at first, but uh, with, with Mike, but you got anything for us? Yeah, well. Uh... An interesting conversation, uh, you know, um, at the last meeting we had, uh, a lot of you guys got the 200, uh, 200 uh, spectrum speed. So I, I, you know, I went and checked my speed, no change. So I called up a uh, spectrum and I got this uh, tech guy on the phone. And I said, uh, how come I'm not getting, basically, how come I'm not getting the 200 megabit speed? So we had this conversation, we went back and forth and he kind of, you know, I told him what my setup was. I've got the router modem spectrum and then I've got my router connected to it. And he said, well, how many devices do you have? And, you know, we went through that, you know, but, but basically we just got two cell phones and, uh, really just two computers because my laptop that I'm on right now is usually not on. 
except for Zoom or if I'm doing something with it. So it's just my Windows 7 and my wife's MacBook. And uh, if the printers are turned on or turned off, there's really not that much we got in the house here. And everything is now pretty close to the, the router since I've moved everything into the living room. Uh, so, you know, we went down that road and then he starts talking about, well, you probably have, you know, cross channels between the two, uh, your, your router and our router. And, you know, we went down that road and I said, well, uh, I happen to know that, uh, cause I set everything up. I said, I said, my router's on channel six and your router's on channel one. I said, there's no overlap on the 2.4, uh, uh, gig uh, frequency. So we didn't talk about the five gig, but uh, I don't use that. So, you know, and he, we just kept going around and I was kind of just countering everything he was saying. And he says, well, I know you're getting the 200. And uh, I go, look, if I was getting 200, I said, I'm doing the same thing your guy did when he installed it. He stood next to the antennas by the routers and he measured the speed. And I said, I get the same speed. I get about 90, 98. I said, there's no increase at all. And uh, I said, I know that is through the air, but I said, I'll tell you what I'll do, which I haven't done yet. I said, I will hook up my Windows 7 computer to your router modem with nothing else connected to it and everything else showed off in the house and check the speed. I just haven't got to do that yet. So I'll do that and then I'll call them back and say, why am I getting the 200? Because I don't really believe all, for, he says to me, uh, he says, and he didn't say it like this. He says, you probably don't believe the stuff I'm telling you, right? And I said, you know, something like that. And I said, well, uh, he says, but, you know, and he went through all this stuff and I said, look, I'll, 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 I'll give you one more, you know, try and I'll, I'll go run a hard wire cable and I'll call you back and I'll tell you that I don't have 200. I just haven't had time to do that crap yet because I don't have a problem and I just haven't done it yet. So we'll see where that goes. But he says, I logged into your, your spectrum router and you're getting the 200. He was going to put put um, the router in in his spectrum unit in bridge mode, which I didn't want him to, because the last one I put in bridge mode, um, I couldn't get it out. And the reason I couldn't get it out is because once it's in bridge mode, you can't log into it anymore to get it out. So I, I definitely didn't want to go down that path again, because I said, look, I like the two units, I said, if my router ever craps out, then I've got to back up with yours. So, uh, but the one thing that we did the part on is I might go into, and I didn't tell him I know how to log into his router. I just didn't want to go there. But he says, well, we can just shut off the two signals, which I've already thought of, which I just haven't around to do it but I can log into the spectrum router and show up the two signals and see if anything changes so the other thing so that's my bit with spectrum but the other thing that I've been playing with um, this week is I you know my spec my spectrum my Silverado truck um, not getting used much these days so I finally decided I had a Saturday was going to go flying and since it was such a ride, I was going flying today, but the fog was too bad. But Saturday was, was no good. So I didn't quite know what to do with myself. So I decided to run my errands and take the truck. Since it hasn't been run for a long time, except for the running on the property, but it hasn't been on the road for quite a while. So as I'm driving around, I go turn on the windshield washer squirters and it doesn't squirt. So, you know, I get back home and I get my book out and I've got the, like the Haynes book or Chilton, whatever it is. And then I've also got factory service manuals. 
I hate pulling out the factory service manuals because there's a thousand pages and five books and the indexing is just terrible. And finding out where you want to go is really more difficult than fixing stuff, actually, finding the right pages. So I decided to get the cheap manual out and I got the diagram out, made a copy of it, and I went out to the car. And you know, the electrical circuit is ridiculously simple. You know, power goes to the switch, out the switch to the fuse under the hood, and then the fuse down to the motor. I was kind of believing that the motor just froze up from sitting there, but um, if the problem with working on something like this is the accessibility of the points and trying to make a measurement's really difficult because you can't get into anything. So the only thing that was accessible was the fuse. One end of the fuse goes back to squish the other, throw it out into the motor. And so what I ended up doing was making a resistance measurement on the fuse and found out which one had a low resistance. So that's obviously the motor. And then I put 12 volts to it and the motor ran. So this is like after the second day of screwing around. So then I uh, wanted to verify, you know, I started taking the fuse box out and that was became too much of a job. I want to verify continuity from the fuse box to the steering column. So after like day three and watching a lot of videos to make a long story short, I finally took all the trim off the bottom of the instrument panel in the top and around the steering column. And this is the unit here, which I now have partially disassembled. I was gonna to try to fix the switch, but it's, I'm afraid to go any further. I'm gonna order a new one. Um, from GM, this is four hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> so after market, it's about sixty, seventy, or eighty dollars, depending what you want to buy. And then, <clears throat> but one reason I wanted to get it partially out is I wanted to look for a part number. I kept coming up with different part numbers, and even though a lot of them looked right, I didn't have enough confidence to order something. So I did find a part number on it, and I did find two of them I liked on eBay and one of them in Amazon. So, mm -hmm. but what I ended up doing is right, there's two kinds of these things and all, all of this stuff is hardwired into here basically. They got another kind that the plugs just plug right on and it's a piece of cake. But with mine, you had to disassemble all this crap around the steering column. Mm -hmm. So I had to go through that so anyway, what I ended up doing was, I can't find the spot here. Um, oh, here, on the plugs, right here, there were six wires. And I said, can I get lucky today? And I started making voltage measurements on them and turning the wipers on and they would come alive with the different speed. So I said, okay, this is for the wipers. So somewhere on this thing has got to be the 12 volts for the uh, the washer motor. So one of them was dead. It's supposed to be a pink wire, but this is very, very red. This top wire here is very red because I was looking for a pink wire underneath the engine hood. So this uh, wire here, I said, okay, that's got to be for the, so I took a continuity, but a probe on this and I, and I probed the fuse in the under under the hood and I got continuity and then I ran the washer motor so I knew that it was this mother that was bad so you know I kind of knew I wasn't going to end it up here but I was trying to find out if I was had to go this far but it was really hard to go this far without going this far hey Paul yeah have you considered just using a squirt bottle <laughs> well, my short arms <coughs> actually what, what amazes me is that that designers actually design things like that you know sitting at sitting at CAD software or actually using drawing board and coming up with something like that you know just the process of doing it so where I ended up was there's two of them on eBay one is for like 72 and the other was for 75. 
And um, I couldn't decide which one. One of them didn't look like it was right, but I, I messaged the guy and he came back and he says, yeah. He says, our database is just incomplete. Don't work on your cost. So I got two on eBay, which I can get at the end of the month in a week. But the one on Amazon, you know, it was cheaper. Uh, it's five bucks shipping. It was $62. And then I got this magic $10 card that I got when I bought my uh, last thing from Amazon. So that'll bring the price down to $55, which is about a $15 savings on a $60 part, which is pretty decent. But I got to wait two weeks. So that kind of slowed me down a little bit. So I decided to think over it, sleep on it. So, but I probably should do the Amazon thing and use the, the credit, be done with it, and uh, and wait two weeks for it. Maybe it'll come sooner, but you know, I'm not driving a truck, so I mean, that's not an issue, but it would be nice to get it in a couple of days. And, and not a lot of rain. And not a lot of what? Rain. Rain? rain? Yeah, it's not raining a lot, so you don't have to clean the windshields that much. Right. Oh, well, like right now, the truck is not drivable anyway. Oh, because wow. When you yeah. pull this thing out, what happens is the wires from the, it looks like an ignition switch. This thing gets sandwiched onto another plug. This is some setup. This is some piece of work. This thing gets sandwiched in between another multi-pin big honking connector like this and it snaps on there and this whole mother thing goes into a large connector and there's a bolt that actually screws on holds it on there all of these little wires you have to get off all the videos i watched these guys were struggling to get these out and i got some really unique tools and i got these out really easy but um so when you take that big monster connector off, I think you probably disable a lot of the stuff in the column and the ignition switch. So right now the truck, you know, especially without the directionals, is not really drivable anyway. It's so, uh, you know, I parked it where I don't have to move it again. So anyway, that's my story. It was fun diagnosing it, but I, I would have like to not have to go down that path, but whatever. Hey, Paul. Yeah. Going back to your uh, Spectrum, we've talked about, you've had this issue for a while with the Spectrum because I remember specifically you talking about uh, having trouble and having, and I remember you specifically saying that you have a router behind a router. And right. yeah, you're, because the Spectrum unit is a router and then you're using a router as well. That can cause issues in, into itself. And the fact that that guy wanted to put that into bridge mode, uh, I would have let him do that um, because bridge mode takes away that double NAT issue that could cause issues for you. Well, couldn't, um, I, do, couldn't I do the same thing by just shutting off the 2.4 and the five gig? Can no. I well, that's another issue you're using. So you're using radio, you've got uh, two additional radios, right? Because they got a 2.4 and a 5 gig on that uh, Spectrum router. And then you've got your router that's probably broadcasting both as well. Is that right? Right, on different channels. On different channels, but you're broadcast. So you've got four radios going. Are they right next to each other? Yes. Yeah. Um, and he, he mentioned, and, and, and I didn't want to uh, say anything, but, you know, I had this nice, nice short piece of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of, uh, cable. Ethernet cable? Yeah. Ethernet cable, you know, that I, uh, got when I bought some 50 and 100 foot pieces that I kind of stopped and, uh, it was real nice. So, you know, they sit right next to each other, but he said, that the unit should be 10 feet apart. Because of the radio interference and yeah. as a ham radio operator, that, that, that should make a lot of sense to you. So, you know. Um, but the speed, the speed, as you, you, you're heading in the right direction. If you take a length of ethernet cable, you take your Windows 7 computer 
and you connect it directly to the spectrum router, turn your other router off completely. Just, to, you know, just turn it off and see what your connection speed is hardwired to another computer. And if it's, if it's 200, then your problem is in the radio interference and the two routers and all the rest of that. If it's 100, then the problem is in the signal that they're providing to you. Yeah, I just haven't spent any time on the issue because I don't have a... But I agree with Sean, uh, let it go into the bridge mode turn off the radios on the other router so you know it's not there unless you just want to use them and i know you have wanted to use them in the past and if you had to get out of the bridge mode very easy you press the reset button and it's reset back into normal well, another thing i could do a, th a third alternative before i run the hardwire <laughs> is to log into the spectrum router and just totally shut my router off. Oh yeah. That is a, that, and there's a fourth option. And the fourth option is to take your spectrum router uh, to the spectrum office and tell them that you want to have it replaced with one that is just a modem. Cause when I do that, I go to the, I go there and I, and they go, do you want to, do you want the one with the router or the, and the modem? I know. I just want the modem because I take care of my network myself. And when that happens, they can't log into my, my router. They can only log into their modem. They can't log into my router. So I take, I take responsibility for what's on my network. I don't rely on them. So I, essentially I've done that by taking their router and giving it to them and saying, I'm done with you. Thank you very much. I'm going to use my own Netgear modem. And that's, yeah. I'm sitting here looking at it right now. I've got a Netgear, <laughs> Netgear, Netgear modem going to my um, Orbi router mesh network. Yeah. So you got the five one, options. The one time I got hit by lightning, you know, they came <laughs> out and replaced uh, their, their router modem. And then when they got the speed to 100, they came out and gave me a, a new router modem. And I said, well, why? He said, well, the old one won't do 100. So, you know, I do get some support. Yeah, DOICS 3.1, if I remember correctly. That's right, yeah. So I, I'm a fan of what Mike has done. Uh, he owns everything. He just, the only thing that the cable company owns is that the actual connection coming in. Otherwise, everything's on him. The thing that, that I understand uh, wanting to be able to have them responsible for uh, if there's lightning, they'll replace it, and that I, that there's a value to that. But you should have a UPS there anyway to protect your stuff. So uh, the uh, cable company's coaxial cable should go right into your UPS and go out of the UPS in, into either your or their cable modem only. And then from the cable modem, you're going to go from it with an Ethernet cable into your router and be done with it. Um, but if you want to go down the road of, uh, using, I, I would get rid of having two routers at the same time. Well, because in, 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 irregardless, even if you didn't have the radios going, you turn the radios off on both and you plug an ethernet cable into your router. Now it's going from your router to their router, to the internet. And each router has something called network address translation. And that there can be issues with that, especially when you get the state tables get mixed, mixed up and so forth. And, you know, you send something out and it doesn't come back because of the routers or the, the network address translation table is, uh, can, can get fouled. That's just an extra layer. You're adding, you've added an extra layer, layer of uh, complexity that could indeed be causing some of your issues. So uh, either go with their router and, mo and modem combination or uh, turn their router <laughs> wireless off and make it bridge mode or even better yet take it back and just get a just get a modem to be continued at the next meeting next month i will Good. have done the diagnosis and i will come back with the answers and you haven't plugged in your you haven't plugged in your windows laptop directly into their uh, router yet and tested the speed or did you no in fact that's better than your windows 7 computer just you know, take a short length of Ethernet cable. Oh, no, no, your Windows doesn't have the Ethernet connection, does it? 
Yes. Oh, it does? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought your your new one didn't have that. Okay. Oh, the, uh, the, uh, are you talking about the new laptop? Yeah, the new laptop. I didn't think you had an, an Ethernet connection on it. You know, um, I don't think there's don't more, more and more of them have stopped doing that. No, there's right. no Ethernet. Yeah. Huh. It, wouldn't be bad, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have an Ethernet to a USB to Ethernet adapter on hand anyway. So my in cases laptop, like this, you could do it and need to do a test. My yeah. uh, Dell uh, Latitude laptop um, uh, has got Ethernet on it. You could do that then. Because all you're doing is running speed test on that. Well, you know, it's, re it's real easy. I, I mean, the, the, the modems are just outside my door here. And I got a 50 foot cable in my closet. I just run straight through the door into the living room. I mean, that's real easy. So the suspense will hang for a while. And so will your cables all around the house. <laughs> I'm done. Uh, well, thank you, Paul. When you were talking about your efforts on the uh, the windshield washer, my gosh, that, that really is a huge effort. I was going to bring up, and I'm sure you checked this out, that on a, one of my Toyotas years ago, I remember they stopped working. There was plenty of fluid. I could hear the motor working. But the guy that I had that worked on my car, he just pulled the plug, the, the hoses off of the, the, the sprayers that were you know in the hood. And, and sure enough, water was gushing out like crazy. So we, we just had to replace those two things on the, you know, the, they were like five bucks each with the nozzles on them. That's really good if you hear the motors running. My motors weren't running. Oh, I thought you said the motor was running. It was running after I put 12 volts to it. After I was in a diagnostic mode and put 12 volts to it from the fuse holder underneath the hood, then the motor ran. But while everything was initially hooked up and I turned on the washer from the turn signal yeah. normally, nothing would happen. No noise. I got lucky with my, uh, my Toyota MR2. When I bought it, it uh, the windshield washer pump never worked. When I would press the button, I wouldn't hear anything. Nothing obviously would come out. So I just went ahead and ordered, it was $8 for a new pump. <laughs> so I ordered one, replaced it, boom, it worked. I got lucky. You told that story once before. Did I? <laughs> I remember old tech. <laughs> there was um, an interesting segment on uh, Tech for Seniors uh, talking about virtual reality and um, showing how um, the goggles that you put over reading the signals and are, are helping senior citizens in all walks of lives. Whereas previously it was primarily for gamers. Um, so if you have not seen this week's uh, Tech for Seniors podcast, um, it's available on YouTube. I know that uh, Ron Brown has sent out the newsletter uh, it's it's well worth and and Sean for your show notes at Tech for Seniors single, not seniors dot com, um, but it's it's worth watching. You know it's an hour long, but there's every every Monday they do this, and if you can't be online at the time they do it, um, Ron spends an inordinate amount of time editing that and then making it available on YouTube. Um, sometimes less than a day later. And I'll, I'll just hop and sit in my recliner, put my feet up, put it on, and hope I don't go to sleep and, <laughs> and, and, and watch it and, and catch a lot of good information. Hey, I got one Zoom question. I've seen people put up a background. Now, I'm not talking about virtual background, you know, but... I know how to do that. But they put up a static background, like when they're not in the room, right? Like if I walk out, you see my room here, right? 
rather than putting up a virtual background, they put up, appears to be, yeah. That, that is my um, account picture. So when you set up your, in the settings of your Zoom account, you can have a profile picture. So you need to have an account to have a profile you, picture. And you do, you've got a Zoom account. Exactly, you, but- You maybe, just go into, go into the settings, somewhere in the settings, I, I don't remember exactly where. Actually, there's, I do, there's, I saw where it was. I, I did see that, but- So it's your profile picture. And so I, 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 that's left over from Christmas. I had a, a Christmas party that Joyce and I went to about five years ago, and they took pictures of everybody there in front of the Christmas tree. And so I, need, I was using that for one of the uh, conferences we have with the Corvette Club. So you need to have an account to have be able to have that profile picture. If you don't have an account, then you can't do that. Well, when you click on Stan's link, it's a good question. I have not clicked on any of these links, not being logged into any account. So I'm going to assume that if nobody has a Zoom account and they click on a link to join a Zoom meeting, the, the answer is correct. There is no profile picture. And so you don't so, see anything. You either have video or you don't have video. So when but, I... When I when I uh, click on Stan's link, it just opens Zoom. Now I'm not logged in or anything. It just, All right, tell you what, turn your video off. Just reach down and click click on the video. Click stop video. Okay, so so that's what you see, and see Stan just has got Huey's account picture because he's in Huey's yep. account and set the meeting up. And Sean's got not isn't logged in. So Sean, Forrest, and Paul are not currently logged into their Zoom accounts, assuming they have Zoom accounts. But if they were, and 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 if there were uh, two things, and if there's a profile picture, then that's what shows up if you if you don't turn your video on. The reason I asked this is because Mindy wanted to have that static picture, and she doesn't have an account. Easy to set one up. So she would need to have to set one up and then put a picture in there and then log in before she um, goes to a Zoom meeting. And there's a setting in the Zoom client that says don't don't log out when the meeting is done. So you can you can close the Zoom client with uh, the checkbox checked to keep you logged in, even though Zoom is closed. So that way, if you click on somebody's meeting link, you'll still be there now. I have three, actually now four Zoom accounts. And so when we do our Wednesday lunch, I'm logged into that particular Zoom account, which has a logo of the uh, Stricom uh, logo that I, of the, of the corporation we, you know, of the government agency that I used to work for. And sometimes I will stay logged in and then I'll log into this one or the weekend meeting and you'll see the Stricom logo all but Warriors simulation okay. because I didn't, because I didn't log out. So what I have to do is log out and then log back in again. All right. Another thing for me to work on. Yeah. It took me a while to get squared away with when I run a meeting like this, I have to be logged in as Huey because it's set up. The, the account is set up for him to run them. I, I don't, I have not tried to do it on my own. But if I log in, if I go to the like the main meeting, which he runs from the WinSig, and then I go off and his caricature comes up, that gets him upset. So I have to log out of his account and come back in as my own. And I don't have a picture in there yet. And I'm not sure how to do it. Well, technically speaking, it's it's the Central Florida Computer Society's account. Yeah. Yeah. And so the logo should be the logo of the Central Florida Computer Society. Good but point. Huey is using it for so many, so much more. Yep. yep. The you know, so that's why it's got his logo on it. And and actually, what I do is, if I just, I have one. I just, I just, right now, I just pushed it across the the lens so that you can't see me, and now I'm opening it again. Oh, oh we know. We heard it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs>
And I see Mike Leach must have left us. He didn't see. He had his hand up at one point, and I didn't get to him when we were talking about something. But uh, anyway, anybody else got anything more? Or are we uh, are we done? Tech never ends, Dan. Yeah. It's tough for, yes, it'll end for ice cream. I will. I'll put in a promo again for MeWe. I've, every one of my emails has got my MeWe link. And I would invite you all to go there. I do a tech of the day post. So every day there's something new on tech in my account. And I do a pun of the day, a little funny, whatever. And that's always there. And if there's latest information on uh, COVID-19, I'm usually posting that. And occasionally there's a partisan post, but I try not to, in my main account, I try not to, not to put partisan posts up. So what are I'm you all? Using. What are you all using for an antivirus? Uh, I use malware bytes. Malware bytes. The premium. Nothing. I'm using the hey, free Sean. malware bytes. Sean, what'd you say? I don't use the antivirus software. Okay. If you use Windows and you're using Windows 10 and you uh -huh. don't add anything to it and you're not on a machine that comes with an antivirus package, then Windows Defender is on by default and so yep. is the, um, the Windows Firewall. And Windows Defender has gotten much more comprehensive over the years with the, especially as Windows 10 came out. It, a lot better than the previous Windows 8 and Windows XP and, and so on. So it's there. It's compatible with many of the antiviruses. They usually tell you don't have two. And um, Malwarebytes has specifically made their application compatible with Defender. So they, you know, the two don't compete with each other. Mm -hmm. I have something to share. Something else that you guys, you guys might be interested in. <clears throat> um, I have a client who uh, he sent me. Uh, let's see, he sent me out to. He, he flew me to California back in 2011 to set up a server for him at his house, and uh, it was it was a Mac Mini uh, with uh, a RAID that we plugged into it, a FireWire RAID, and uh, that is still running to this day. And he pays me monthly to, to look at it and make sure that it's backed up and that it's working. And, that, you know, it, it's been very, it's been a, quite lucrative considering the amount of work that I have to do. Well, it's getting old and he's running out of space. It was a 12 terabyte when I initially set it up. He's at nine terabytes now. So I, uh, let, me, let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, he ordered one of these uh, at my just at my suggestion. QNAP is a company that makes network attached storage, and this is uh, I or, he ordered one of these. It's about twelve hundred dollars. Your screen isn't up yet. It isn't. No, I see it. I see it. Oh, really? see it. All right. Don't know why I don't see it. Okay, keep going. So it's a, it's called a QNAP TBS. X72 XT, which is the model number. Um, I had him order this and uh, five 16 terabyte enterprise uh, 7200 RPM three and a half inch discs. Each of the drives was $350. So he wound up spending about $1,700 on, uh, on the drives and $1,200 on this. And uh, we said, I had, and we talked about it and uh, he isn't home a lot. You know, so he's, he works, he, he lives at home, but he works and goes to China and goes to different places. And, and uh, he's an executive at Disney. So um, we, we agreed that two of the drives, it's a RAID 6. So of those four drives, only two, the amount of two put together is the storage capacity. Two of the drives are running as uh it, two could fail in essence. So he's got 32 terabytes of storage. Uh, and uh, I put it together here in Orlando 
and mailed it to him. And um, something that I did that is pretty cool is I installed a product called Zero Tier. It's an open source. Uh, in essence, it makes a, uh, a LAN connection available to anywhere in the world. So as long as you're both on this same virtual network, it's a local device. So I installed this on his, and I'll, I'm gonna bring this up here. I'm gonna, this is the interface for the device. It'll take a second to, uh, to come up. Uh, maybe, well, uh, let me see. See if I can get it to reconnect. Uh, there we go. So this is this uh, this uh, QNAP server. This network hard drive is sitting on his on a desk in his office in Pasadena. Let me see if I can. I'm not showing anything that's going to be compromising. Um, this is the interface to actually control the unit. So I'm logging in. His last name happens to be Wise. Uh, I'm logging in, and this is how you make make adjustments to the device. We're just using it as an Apple file share, but it has a lot of other features. You can use it to, uh, you know, for video streaming within your home, like a Plex server. Uh, you can set it up as a router. You can set it up as uh, a virtual machine server. Um, all kinds of really cool features. It's similar to Synology. If you ever heard of a Synology uh, yes. attached storage. Yes. Yeah, so it's the it's a competitor to Synology. This, this product apparently is, um, is favored in the video and photo uh, industry over Synology. Uh, I'm not quite sure, maybe, I don't know if it's because of just familiarity or if it's because of um, uh, reliability. I, mean, I have to read up more on it. What um, kind of trans, but let's say you wanted to transfer a large file. Let's just say you were transferring a video file, not streaming it, but just transferring it. Yeah. What, what kind of transfer speeds do you get? So the, the transfer speed, it has two, two and a half gigabyte connections on the back of it. So uh, he doesn't have a, he's doesn't have a high speed network, but if down the road, when he retires, he wants to get more into video and, and video work. So there's a possibility we might upgrade his network at, at his home to be a 10 gig network. So he'd have some pretty good transfer speeds. Uh, right now, he's just got a one gig network. So, um, and it's a little slow right now for me to connect. I mean, we're think about it. We're I'm going from Orlando to to pa uh, Pasadena, California, but this is the interface for this unit, and uh, all kinds of controls. One of them here is to look at the dashboard. Can you see it now, Mike? Yes. Okay. So here's the 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 uh, dashboard tells you the uh, um, how long it's been up. The uh, temperatures of the and the speed of the fans, how much CPU is being used. It's idle right now. It's uh, other than, I think they're back. It's doing a backup to uh, Backblaze. So um, Backblaze, as for what I can tell, has the best prices for uh, copious amounts of data. He's got nine terabytes. So he's gonna wind up paying in the neighborhood of about 600 a year uh, for his backups. But this data is important to him. He's got, like I said, nine terabytes. He, we just finished copying uh, the data. I mean, I, he, I can remote into his uh, other server. I mounted the, the drive on his other server and then just transferred the data that way. Um, but being able to connect to it like this is fantastic because I simply go to a menu in my on my any of my computers. I connect to his network, this virtual network called Zero Tier, that I've set up, and uh, within, within seconds, I'm able to access any of the computers that I've installed zero tier on, including this network attached storage. So a fantastic option for him too, because if he's traveling and he's got his laptop or he's got his uh, iPad, he can access his data uh, when he's out and about through the zero tier system and it's secure. 
So um, I'm tickled pink with it. And I've got another client who ordered, an, he, I've got the drives here behind me and uh, he's supposed to get the, his QNAP in tomorrow. He's here in town though. And I'm gonna set it up the same way and get him set. He's got, he does video work as well. Um, and uh, pretty, pretty cool stuff. So that's a QNAP, a competitor to, uh, to Synology. At, at one time, I used uh, network attack storage. In fact, sitting here at my feet is about a first or second generation. This is a, a Buffalo. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes. Box. Okay, single, single, uh, I don't know, probably five. Station. Buffalo link station. Let's see what happens. Yeah, that I I set one of those, uh, two of those up for a client back in the mid two thousands, and uh, and they're they're nice, but it's not the same as having a USB hard drive connected for backup, and then be on your network at home if that's what you want. So right. uh, it's hard for me to to take this other one. I have a a raid box that takes two at the moment just two 1.5 gigabyte drives side by side with a usb3 cable and the usb3 cable plugs into a usb3 port on my main desktop computer and then it's shared across my home network and i can transfer files and use it for image backups or file by file backups and i found at least with my current network, I found that the the transfer speeds were much faster, especially now that USB 3s come out. Under USB 2, it wasn't, but now, now I do have a one gig network now, but as I understand the way Ethernet works, the speed of your entire network is limited to the speed of your slowest component that's on the network at the time that you're you're doing things. So I don't have, I have cat 5 e cable in the walls of the house. So that's capable of a gig. Um, but I don't have um, gigabit adapters in, in everything that I've got. I do, I've replaced my switches because I have a, a 12 port switch. That's now a gigabyte. Um, but I don't think that I can transfer at one gigabyte across my ethernet network. I haven't ever tested it. I probably should test it. I think I'm limited in to speed to 300 megabits um, instead of a gigabit. Cause I think why, every, everything's why 300. 300. Isn't 300 the, the previous standard for cat five? No, 100. Or is that all oh, 100? Okay, so I think I'm, okay. So I think I'm limited to 100. Well, if you if you have a if you have a switch that's capable of a gigabyte and you have two computers that are plugged into that switch that are both capable of a gigabyte then in theory you should be able to get gigabyte connect you know probably 800 900 speed even if there's a 100 megabyte a megabit device plugged into it into uh, that same switch yes the switches are independent Okay. So, uh, yes, yeah, so you could, you should theoretically, you should be able to get a gigabit speed. Now, if you were going from that 100 gigabyte, uh, gigabit uh, computer or 10 gigabit computer, then that is your slowest and that's involved in the transaction. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this, I rebuilt my uh, computer and the motherboard that I put in it has two um, one gigabyte, one gigabit. Um, adapters on the motherboard. It was designed for gaming. Well, in and theory, I, then you should be able to get more than a gigabit in speed because you'd have to, I mean, they'd have to be set up to do that. That's right? another that's subject a, that would be good to, to do a tutorial on because I really haven't looked uh, at how to use two one gigabit ports and get faster communications. I'm, I wouldn't be the good guy for that because I don't know, but I, I've I've heard that in uh, conversations on videos and stuff I've read. I've never done that. Some but of I do, know, I do know that a gigabit between a gigabit switch with gigabit computers on either side of it should be able to transfer at close to gigabits or at gigabit speeds internally. 
So some of the little um, um, knocks that I have been sharing with you on the uh, tech sig and some of the emails um, have two one gigabit um, Ethernet connectors on them, which is interesting. And um, oh, two yeah. on there, huh? Yeah, some of them do. The, As cool. the ASRock box did. Um, and some of those tiny little things, I just, you know, it's amazing what, what they're capable of doing. Yeah, there you go. So this is a, this is called a Protectly. The, the brand of this is Protectly. And this is what I use for PFSense. Actually, this, I, this is, I just got this. Um, I have a client who moved from Orlando to uh, Pittsburgh and he needed a he needed a network a router a better one that he was using i think he was using like a netgear or a, maybe a netgear or something like that so i said well let me set up this uh pf sense on a protectly and you can get pf sense on their their branded hardware which is called netgate uh, the brand of the name of the company that supports uh pf sense but this is a less expensive solution this is about 350 dollars, and it's got uh six ports on here of course we were only using two one for his one for his uh to go to his cable modem or to his fiber connection and the other one was to his switch and then everything from there was you know the wireless and so forth but uh this is this is a kind of a specialized unit because you don't usually see this is a pc this, i could install windows on this um but it, it it's protectly if you look at protectly and uh um uh, Amazon, or if you go to Alibaba and you search for PF Sense or you search for Protectly, this these types of devices will come up. I have one uh, downstairs that is not as good as this one, and my client just recently replaced this. Didn't talk to me about it. Replaced it with a Synology router, which is those are good too, uh, but not as good as PF Sense. So I said to him, my immediately immediate, immediate reaction was, "What are you gonna do with that old one?" Because this is I'm thinking to myself, this one's better than the one I have. He said, well, make me an offer. I said, I'll give you hundred bucks for it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is three years old, but it's still a good, a good price, a good uh, device. Now, what does that do? This is a router. So I install PFSense, which is a um, open source FreeBSD uh, router product. I install it on here. And then um, I'll show you the interface for that. This, but, this is, but, in, but in layman's terms, what, what does that do? No, it's, is that a, is that uh, is that providing better security? Is that screening yes. stuff? It's a it's a it's a firewall. Okay. Yeah. So Good. yeah. So this is uh, you go here. This is the interface for my PS Sense, and I've got all kinds. It gives me all kinds of information. Uh, I can set it up as a and I have I have it set up as an open VPN server. So if I'm out and about, I can remote. I can connect to it as a VPN connection back to the home. Um, it, it has something called PF blocker, which is kind of like Pi-hole, where it'll block ads and I can do geo IP blocking. So um, I actually have it turned on so that anybody that tries to connect from anywhere other than the United States, by default, they will be blocked. Um, yeah, I've got Africa and I've got all these, Africa, Europe, Antarctica even, there's 47 IP ranges there. All kinds of stuff. Um, it's super flexible. It gives me graphs of the speed that the internet's going right now. I'm downloading something, so I'm there. There's my uh, my speed is. I've got a 400 connection, so I'm rocking the internet right now. And I am I am using the internet to my fullest, and I'm still video streaming. And my my internet is not. I haven't had, seen any glitches. So that's all. This is, and this is why you don't have a antivirus. You don't need it because you're doing all this screening of stuff. Part of it, part yeah. I use a Mac, so I mean, Macs can get viruses, but I am careful, and my wife's careful, so we don't. We it's not like I mean, Windows is. You're really as a Windows user, you're really getting pelted with. Um, now, about a year or two ago, probably more, about like two, you talked about this capability, and you showed us some of what you had. And the way you described it was that you had a desktop computer type. I page. did. And there was a time when I first tower, started. A tower computer doing I all did. I had a, um, I had a, 
a Dell, an old Dell computer that somebody had given me. I bought a network card for 25 bucks or 20 bucks or whatever. And, and now you've got, now you've got. Now I've got this tiny device that uh, sits next to my, my modem, my just modem, Paul, not a, not a, uh, not a, uh, a combination modem router. And uh, I very rarely have any problems with network, with internet or network. And I, for wire, this does not take care of wireless. Like this, this is just a wired connection. My wireless is handled by um, Ubiquity unified uh, wireless access points, like the one that's right there, that's hanging on the wall. That's power over ethernet. And that's plugged into a switch that, uh, th that's how I get my wireless. And I've got five of those, which is overkill. I have a, not a very big house. I've got four in the house and one in the garage. So I never have problems with, inter with wireless. Um, you know, the way I look at it is I'm learning from this stuff all the time. And, uh, but I can't, I can't say enough good things about PFS. It's fantastic. And once you set it up and you get it just right, you just set it, and, you know, once in a while, I'll get an email from it saying that there's an update and I'll, I'll wait for a little bit and then I'll update it, but it doesn't have a lot of updates. Their, their thing with the NetGate who, who uh, distributes PFSense is um, uh, uptime and security, not adding all kinds of stuff to have constantly have to have it updated. There's a branch of PFSense that is called OpenSense. And they're constantly, from what I understand, I don't I haven't used it. Um, they are constantly adding features to it and constantly having to update it and update it. And that and up, lots of updates can introduce uh, problems on their own. And uh, PFSense is pretty solid. I get I have to update it every maybe four or five months. Uh, they'll put a, a, a free BSD update that requires uh, some, you know, download. So it's fantastic. I can't say enough good about PFSense. So that'd be a fun project for you, Mike. Yeah. yeah. With all my <laughs> other projects, yeah. <laughs> you need more. Yes. Uh, um, so anyway, that's it. I, re I do recommend, I'll put, an, I'll put a link to Zero Tier. Um, Zero tier is cool in that it's it's a it's kind of a VPN connection between two computers. So if you if you or more than one, you can have more than that. But you uh, create a zero tier network. Let me see. Um, yeah, I won't show it, but you can create a zero. You, you go to zerotier.com. You can log in with a free, you can create an ID, a free ID, and a free account, and you can create up to a hundred networks for free. And once you create a network. You install the software on the devices you want to be able to connect back and forth. So, say I can I can install it on my computer. I can join my computer to that network, and then Mike, you could install it on your computer, and you could join that network. And we uh, confirm it in the web interface. You know these computers, yes, they can be on the network. And then it's like you're in the same room as me. You can, we're on the same network, so it's considered a local device. And connecting is great, so I can be out. I could be up in Illinois visiting my parents. And as long as I've got the zero network, zero tier network turned on, I can access my server here in the house. I don't have to have a VPN because that is the connection. Um, it, it sounds like it would make sense if I, if I really wanted to combine my Linux computers and my Windows computers because networking between Linux and Windows is a real pain and, and getting Samba working and getting all these other things lined up and making them function and sharing the drives and so on. I did it with my second computer. I can, I can share now between my Windows compute desktop and my Linux desktop that's in here, but that took me almost three or four months of reading and playing with, with stuff and setting it up. So actually having a device as you're describing and just putting the application on each computer, I'm sure there's a Linux app and a Windows app oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and so on. And then an Android right. app maybe and an iPhone app and so on. So if, if all those devices can all just join that network and share files as you as you've set up. Yeah, it's it it's more it so for, much better. I would say zero tier is more for if you want to be on the same network and you're not in the and the computers are not on the same True. Network, you're at home uh, and you want to connect to your father's computer in uh, Illinois. 
and you have it installed on. So his computer is always on the zero tier network and yours is. So you have a, it's, and, and it uses UDP. So that's faster than TCP. So you can use that to connect back and forth. Um, in, in the same home, you're on the same, you're already on the same network, right? Your, your Windows computer. It's just, it's just at the comp setting the computers up. It's, it it's used like to be. Ethernet. It's like having another ethernet uh, plugged into your computer. True, but it used to be. It used to be that we would put. Um, oh, help me, Stan. What's what's the um, what's the network program we were using in the early '90s? Not not Novell Light. It was Art Art. Not I was going to say Artisoft. Was it yeah. something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some something like that. Yeah. And and um, it you know it, it came in a box and you installed the client on, you know. It was a peer-to-peer -peer network, and you just went ahead and installed the software on each of the computers you wanted on the network. Pretty well set it up, and you have peer-to-peer -peer network. Then Windows 3.1 came out with a big claim to fame that it was a peer-to-peer -peer network, made networking easy. And then um, by the time you got to Windows, I don't remember if XP had the, the groups or not. But window, I mean, Windows uh, 8 had it, and then Windows 10 had sort of did away with the groups. And they've made, they've made network work groups. They've made, they've made networking, peer-to-peer -peer networking harder. And then, then especially now that if you're using a Linux network, um, it's much harder. I, I mean, I would just as soon have an app that's operating system independent even if it was a device and, you know, it just boom connected and there's your network. Mm -hmm. And another reason that I don't do it anymore anyway, I used to do it professionally, so. Um, but is your, isn't your, uh, your Linux, your Mint Linux or Linux Mint uh, laptop, doesn't that automatically have SMB enabled by default? It might, I haven't played with the laptop yet. The, the, uh, the desktop did, but in order, all the research I did said that I had to set up a Samba server. Um, and I had to have Samba installed and then I had to open it up and I had to put passwords on everything. And, and I could, sh when I initially did it, I could share in one direction, I'm trying to remember. I think I could, I could see the Linux drives with, uh, because Samba was set up, but I couldn't see the Windows drives. And then I had to go in and do things with Windows networking and do some other stuff with Linux that I've since forgotten. And it was all done with terminal commands. And uh, finally I got it so that now on the uh, Linux machine, I can see the Windows drives and have permissions to, to go in either direction. But sometimes when I'm in a hurry, I just grab a flash drive and stick it on there and run it across. You know, I, I, I have absolutely no backup of the Linux machine, but then there's nothing on it. All it, all it is is uh, YouTube and uh, uh, videos and, and audios and things like that. I, I, at one time I thought about putting Flex on it and making it a server because I've got, I've got the, like three, I think three 500 gigabytes in the tower. Then maybe three 250s, something like that. So I, you know, I could have storage and have it on the network, but I'm, I'm too lazy. Everything, everything now is, is done with streaming, so. Yeah, well with, Lin with the Linux, with that laptop here, I, I wasn't really thinking about connecting to it from other computers, but I was thinking about connecting it to your Windows or your SMB shares on your uh nas or whatever that is pretty straightforward isn't it maybe i just haven't looked at it and there should be some kind of a network browser. there was no again there was no reason there was really no reason for it because there's nothing to me it's just like the chromebook you know the chromebook about the only time that i wanted access to anything to store information was sending stuff to my google drive and i and i don't use that anymore right. um and I'm, I'm with uh, Proton Mail. It comes, the, the paid version comes with Proton Drive. So the, the stuff that I consider quote unquote critical to have between computers is up on Proton Drive. 
and and that I can just click on it and share on any one of these platforms. So you know, I can I you know, well let me just do that since we're doing this. Share screens again. That's my game that's playing in the background. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's see here. I still haven't figured out how to get rid of this little drop down share thing. It's always right in the middle of my stuff. So let me just move this down so I can see it. All right, so here is my, my inbox on Proton Mail. Here's my calendar on Proton Mail. Here's my contacts on Proton Mail. Any one of them, I can pop open Proton Drive. Once it's connected, it's, it's firmly connected. Now, granted, I'm going to Switzerland and back. Okay, so there's, there is my Proton Drive. For example, I've got Bill O'Reilly's uh, Killing Crazy Horse to listen to one of these days, quote unquote. So if I happen to be somewhere where I am actually going to listen to an audio book, I'll just unzip it from whichever one I want. I also wanted the, uh, the latest Duke Energy bill available. And I wanted some pictures that were available that I could get to. So, um, and, and I've got a, um, a career documentation, which I wanted my son to have. So uh, some stuff is on here now. I really have not populated this like I populated my Google Drive. But whatever, whatever app I'm using on that notebook, uh, it, it, you know, it would be like Open Office, and I'd use Open Office uh, right. If I then wanted to save it, I would then open up my Proton Drive and save it there. And then I'd come in here to my desktop and it would be there and then I could just put it in whatever file in or I wanted to work with it. So this, is, this has replaced Google Drive for me. It's replaced uh, Microsoft's OneDrive um, and it comes with my subscription. Um, and this is only it. accessible through a web browser? Um, I don't know if, if I, I'm pretty sure they have Android and, um, iOS apps, um, because I've, I've put, I know I've put the mail and the calendar and the contacts on my Android phone. I have not put the drive on there, but I think so. I'm not sure. That's a good oh. question. But what about on your computer? So can you mount a... No, it does not have an app for the computer. Okay. No, there isn't a Windows 10 app for Proton Drive. It's, do, you it's have, a, do you have any problems navigating around? This one of the things with, with Linux that I, have, uh, that I have struggled with is navigating the file system. Like, so for instance, say you want to uh, upload something to... A proton drive is it easy to find if you wanted to do that, that here and click new upload is it easy to find where that file is located yes okay yes um i do have zoom on that notebook so next time around we can take a look at the screens but the the file system will have a home icon and then under home is videos and the same structure videos and music and pictures okay. Uh -huh. whatever um when you put i put a, a 32 gigabyte um sd card uh in there and um uh, it it just popped up on my desktop as another drive that was available mm -hmm. so i saw that um uh, but i didn't i didn't really have any problems Good. accessing it right so cool and and they one of, again on um, well I didn't do it let me let me let me do this one more there's one more app we can actually do it again let's see here um, I'm going to open it up on my other computer let's see if it opens let's see what's happening here are you going to open or not let's see all right I'll do it here where's the VPN there we go so Proton VPN Okay, let's see if it's going to take. No, I didn't do it for this. So I've, I've not yet logged into 
this, so give me a chance to second. Okay. Let's see here. I'm going to have to get it. Okay. So we're going to move this off the screen here. Okay, so I want proton. The one downside to Proton that I see is you're kind of stuck with their uh, their apps and their uh, having to do things through the web browser and whatnot. Yeah. You don't have the flexibility that you have with uh, some of the other mail programs. And I understand that you're you give up some of the other flexibility because of uh, security. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out if that would be a deal breaker for me. Yeah. All right, now I can go back. Okay, so I can go back into, would you go on the VPN? Uh, contacts file, there we go, log in. No, I didn't like that. Okay. I do have a free account on one of my other Proton accounts. For some reason, this is not working with my emails. I may not have set it up yet in my premium account. But it's a free VPN. And the only difference between the free version and the paid version is speed and the number of servers around the world that you can use. And you'll, again, in the um, Tech for Senior, there's a, there, there, in the Q&A for it, there were questions about free VPNs and they were really um, playing them down, saying if, if it's free, it's not good. And I think that the Proton VPN is very good, it's very secure, and it, it worked just fine when I was trying to do it. Let's see here. Oh, I got another screen. Okay, well, it wants another. It wants my password and my username again. I'll I'll show it next time around. We'll play with it and we'll we'll um we'll go different places and we'll pop out in different parts of the world. We'll do do that. I would I would I would have argued. And I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have argued, but I could argue with the tech for seniors folks that if you're running a if you're running PF Sense. That's yeah. free. The open VPN on there is free. They're yeah. going to they're going to also add WireGuard, and that is free. Um, well, you got to you got to understand the if you're at the consumer level, right? And then if you're at the quote senior citizen consumer level, which right. unfortunately we all get categorized in a level that we don't have very much technical knowledge, and which isn't really true. Mm -hmm. You have as much knowledge as you want. You know, I, right. I could certainly not tear down. Uh, a windshield wiper washing right. thing, thing like Paul does. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it's whatever our specialties are, but for the average person, you want to click on a button and have a VPN there. It's just mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So um, Bob, uh, I mean, and if he's watching this on the recording, Bob Goshold, I think is his last name, is the... Um, advocate for Avast. And so he was advocating the Avast uh, VPN. And it's a paid add-on. It's not very expensive. And so if you were to get the Avast suite, which includes the VPN, although I understand, if I'm not mistaken, the VPN might be free. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't recall. But anyway, all you do is click a button and, and it's there. You turn it on, you turn it off. And um, 
the same thing with the Proton VPN. If you get the free version, it's just a button on the desktop. You log into your account. Once you're in your account, you either turn it on or you turn it off. So if you're going to go to a credit card site and do banking and you do want a VPN in the circuit, you just click it. Now, in your case, the VPN's physically co-located where you are. So Huey was saying, if you're home, I don't see the advantage of the VPN. To me, I want the VPN in the circuit that's going out of my house through my ISP and then to some location not co-located with me and then it pops out and goes onto the internet and does its thing. Well, that's what most of these VPNs do. They take you out of your house, you're in an encrypted channel, it gets decrypted at the servers of the VPN location, and then it goes out on the internet. The response comes back through them, gets encrypted, comes back to you, your VPN app decrypts it, and then you see the content on your screen. So in your case, Sean, if you're at home and you have your computer and you now want to do the same thing, you want to connect with your credit card company. So your computer goes to your VPN, which is right where you are. No, no, no. Isn't it? It's, I mean, it's physically it located where the, you are. The goal of my VPN is to be when I'm not home. Yes. So, and, and, and I agree with that. Right. There's no need. I could, I could, I could get a third party like you're talking about, like, like PIA or, or another VPN service. And that's another thing you can do with this PFSense is you can configure PFSense to be connected not only to your internet service provider, but also be connected via VPN to a VPN provider. And you can set up rules that say this computer, instead of going out through the normal channel of the, of the internet service provider, always use the, always use the VPN. Okay. You know, and I don't have reasons to do that. There are people who do that. Okay, well, whatever. Uh, my my goal is I'm out in a public space, and I want to be able to connect back to home for to access my servers or access my network, uh, or just not be on the, you know, have a secure connection on an open Wi-Fi, you know, to be able to. And, and I'm going to Switzerland, and you're coming home. That's all. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, right, and that I, you're going to see a lot more. Uh, uh, lag time than I will. Now, if I'm in Switzerland, although interestingly enough, I've done some I've done some speed tests, and and I haven't seen that much in the way of ping lag. So. That's good. Maybe they've got some. Uh, they're doing some tricks with the uh, with their um, with their networking that makes it faster. Which then they do have. They do have like the ser they have servers in Miami. So if you have the free, oh, okay, if you have the free VPN, you go through the Miami server. This is the, um, this is the Proton. Yeah. Okay. And and you get 30 days to play with the premium before it drops back to the free. And so you get the full, you also get a chance to see what the full throughput is and see, see what your speeds are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We've monopolized a lot, Stan. So, <laughs> yep. Mike. Yes, Fartz. Um, you said you use uh, malware based premium. There's a mal. There are two of uh, two premiums. There's one just malware based premium. Then there's a malware based premium plus private. I have not looked into what that is. Um, they probably have added other products on for you know for monetary purposes that provide other services. Uh, if it says plus private, maybe they've added a VPN to it. I'll have to look and see what. Okay, I uh, just looked at prices. The uh, the premium was thirty nine ninety nine, and it's now twenty three ninety nine, and the plus private was uh, ninety nine ninety nine, and it's fifty nine ninety nine now. But uh, would... both discounts sound very good because uh, all yeah. I did is renew mine, and I paid the. I paid more than thirty nine ninety nine to renew it. You were running speed tests while ago. Where Paul was, and I hadn't run one in I don't know a year or two, maybe. Then I tried it then, and I was up. I was one eighteen point five. 
several times, 118 to 115, somewhere in that range. And just a few minutes ago, I did it again, and I'm everything is 234 and 235 up and 11 points, three or four down. So uh, you've got the new, so you're on Spectrum. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm on yeah. Spectrum. Yeah. yeah, you got the new. And I'm on, Very I'm on my first time you do that. Something, something in the system has to recognize okay. that you, you've done a connection at that higher speed, and the next time you do it, then from then on, it seems to be connected. And that's on my PC. I hadn't done it on my laptop. I'm on my laptop right now. So last time for the uh, regular meeting, my laptop it kept breaking up. I don't know, and I was going in and out, and Stan had to sign me on several times, and I don't know what was the cause of that, but I'm, no problems tonight, so. Uh, a non-technical question. Who here has gotten the um, COVID uh, vaccine? I got the first one um, Tuesday of last week. And I'm scheduled already. Uh, I'm still in Oak County. And they sent me a text and gave me a date in February. I believe it's the 12th or whatever it is. And told me to pick a time for that day for my second shot. And I went on and picked a time for my wife and I. And then they sent me back and I printed out my ticket. And then after I got my, I wasn't there, but maybe 35 minutes. And um, the last thing when you checked out or left after you'd done your 15 minute resting or waiting was to sign up for your second shot, but I'd already done that. So I didn't even have to do that. So we're set for the second one. Paul, I saw you raised your hand. You get yeah, your- I got my first shot, you know that. Okay. And Stan, you you had an interesting uh, thing on your email. Yeah, you, I, you got it sort of without knowing you got it. Absolutely, I was on a double blind for the uh, modern Moderna uh, clinical trial, and I was sure I'd gotten the placebo because I had no effect at all. I think my I have a bit more reaction to the regular flu shot. And, and when they, you got the second shot, you didn't have a reaction to it. No, I had the second shot. In, the first shot was in August, end of August. The second one was the end of September, and no reaction at all. So I was sure I had the placebo. But when I went up there last week, they gave us the option of unblinding, they called it. And uh, if you had gotten the placebo, they would give you the regular one. And they said, no, you did get the actual I'm vaccine. Gonna have to, I'm going to have to take off. I'm, I'm kind of out of time. I got stuff to do. OK. All See right. you. Thank you, guys. Okay. <laughs> Stay safe. I had an interesting thing with my appointments. The first appointment I made for us, we were to get the uh, Moderna shot. And so uh, then when I signed up and got my second appointment, before I even got my first shot, it said Pfizer. And I said, uh-oh. So when we went and got the first shot, I messaged, he says, well, you were supposed to get the Moderna, but we ran out. And now we have <laughs> Pfizer. So you get Pfizer for both of them. So. There's a story that was on the 35 News this evening, which will probably be on again at 11. And uh, they are saying now the FTC is allowing the shots to be mixed. Oh, really? really? Because of because of distribution and, and possible shortages, saying that the mechanism of the shots and the base DNA material of the shots is the same, even though the additional things that are in it are slightly different. Mm -hmm. Me personally, if I haven't gotten it yet, I would kind of want to stay with the same one, but. I would too. And uh, I've had some neighbors and, neighbor, and they, uh, they're waiting for the Johnson & Johnson because they don't want to have to give it one shot. But I've looked on the internet and I'm seeing the Moderna and the, uh, Moderna and the, and the Pfizer, about 95% effective. And the Johnson & Johnson showing 75 about 70 so that surprised me too yeah well what from what we're being told these things don't work anyway because you still after it's all said and done and you've waited your month you still have to wear a mask which is ridiculous no. so if i can if i'm still gonna have to wear a mask i don't need to get a shot there's something is wrong with either the shot itself or what our politicians are telling us i think it's the latter yeah well that's now ridiculous now they're talking and, about double mask. Yeah. Have you, have you, have you heard that? <laughs> and how about sitting in a room, signing, sitting in the Oval Office and signing things with a mask on and you're all by yourself? Are you a complete idiot? 
Yeah, I think I think they Um now. I this see is people, being, this is I being recorded, walking, so I will not their, I will not make political comments. <laughs> they're walking their dogs around the block around my neighborhood by themselves with a mask on. Yeah. yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> Uh, you're more, you're way more than six feet from anybody around, and wearing the mask, you're not they're not going to get any closer to you. I guarantee it. Well, I think that six foot rule would be where there's still air. I know. And I mean, if it's any breeze or something, it, it can go further than six feet for sure. I would think. Well, it's all ridiculous. And if they're going to tell me that I'm going to still need to wear a mask, then there's no need for me to get a shot. Well, I'm looking at it from the standpoint that I'd like to fly to Omaha. The target date right now is May. And backing off two months, that, that, that tells me I'm, if I'm going to get the shot, then, then I should look to try to get it in March or before. So we're, we're considering it. Uh, the only feedback I've had is one of my good friends, uh, and, and Stan knows him, uh, right after he got his second shot, and it was the Pfizer, woke up about two in the morning with severe chills. He said it was so bad he was shaking in the bed. You know, it woke his wife up, and he was just literally like that. Oh. And um, that that he was on the verge of, of getting up and going to the ER. And he oh. just said to his wife, check my, my temperature. He, did, he wasn't running a fever. And he, she just went and got some blankets and, and, you know, put them on him. And he woke up the next morning weak, but okay. So he said, you know, that was the most significant reaction to any shot that he's ever had. And he had gotten the second shot the previous day. So he had his, his chill. And chills are one of the, by, you know, one of the side effects that yep. theoretically have, can happen. So... I'm waiting for some of the other people that are on other uh, Zoom conferences that I'm on and that I know and speak to on a regular basis that are getting ready to get their second shots to see whether they come down with the same thing. But I think everybody's an individual. So regardless of whether, whether people do have them, Stan didn't have any reaction to it at all, you know. Yep. But the only other thing is you, if you've had it, and you've developed antibodies, then an antibody test is supposed to be pretty accurate in showing whether you have had it. Nobody's talked at all about a test to show what level of protection do you have. Do you now have antibodies in your system as a result of having the vaccine? You know, they haven't said go out and get, you know, if you want to know, go get a, a, an antibody test, because I don't think that's antibodies of, caused by your body against the, vi the, the virus, not antibodies that have built up caused by the vaccine. So it would be nice to, to have some kind of confirmation that you know that you're protected. No, we'll see. I got, I got another month and a week before I have to make a decision. All right, well, let's all wish Huey well. Yep. Yep. Hopefully by the time he sees this, he's up and about and, and uh, maybe a little sore, <laughs> I would imagine. But the technology of heart surgery is pretty amazing these days. Wow. Hope he does Somebody okay. who had the operation 20 years ago asked if he was getting a pig's valve and this is the aortal valve, I guess it's going. And he said, no, they're, they're using cows now as well. So he's going to be part cow. <laughs> 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 they yeah. go up to a vein and go to a, a, an artery rather than put this in. Yep. Yeah. Okay, guys. Yeah, enjoy it. Stay safe and I'll see you all next time. I'm going to stop forget. the recording. Stop the recording, yep. Bye. Thanks. Thanks for the info, Sean. Yeah, it was very informative and uh, okay.